Uh, good evening. Welcome to the WVU College of Law's discussion, Player Activism, More Than Just an Athlete, co-sponsored by the Sports and Entertainment Law Society and the Black Law Students Association. Uh, my and name is Will. Society. I'm sorry? And the Labor Law Society. Oh, and the Labor Law Society, excuse me, and the Labor Law Society, thank you. Um, so my name is Will Ree, and I'm a professor here at the College of Law, and I am really lucky to be joined by my fabulous colleagues who are all subject matter experts able to talk about the multifaceted nature of the recent NFL national anthem protests. So uh, Professor Atiba Ellis is gonna start us off, followed by Professor Ann LaFasso, Professor Josh Verche, and Professor Bob Bastris. All of their impressive bios are in your brochure. We'll finish the evening with a question and answer session. Um, so without further ado, Let's please begin with Professor Ellis. Well, good evening. I, um, I'm a stander. I'm the son of a Amy Zion preacher, so you know. I see a big podium and I'm like, oh, you know what I'm talking about. Like, so, but the point though, and in fact, I wanted to evoke that, and it, because think about what today is. Today's the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. And arguably, that was one of the sort of watershed moments in thinking about civil rights and racial equality in American society. I would argue that this moment, too, in its multifaceted scope, is another one of these moments. 50 years later, we are seeing a different kind of protest, a different kind of movement, and there are challenges and dynamics within this that are both interracial and intraracial. And as my biography, I think, suggests, but maybe underplays, one of the things I do here at the College of Law is teach critical race theory. So I wanna talk about this from the point of view of a critical race theorist. And if you have not heard of critical race theory, the idea of critical race theory is to look at the structure of American society and in particular American law from the point of view of it being a tool to the end of organizing America or even the world, if depending on your scope, on the basis of race. So there are a number of ways of looking at this in terms of doctrine, but it seems to me that the dispute here, the protest, the injustices that are sought to be brought attention to and urged to be remedied are all about race because as we know, the protest, though had in the immediate term, you know, it's about Colin Kaepernick, it's about his inability to get a job, it's about the fact that this all started with him taking a knee during the national anthem in successive games and then ultimately being released by the 49ers and then being unable to get a job. This inspires protest among other players and reactions from players and coaches and owners, but it also brings out discourse from everyone starting with the President of the United States. And I would argue to you that this is a moment where we are seeing the same kinds of tensions that we saw played out from 1954 to 1968 and through the 70s, remember John Carlos, and taking the opportunity to protest on the Olympic stand, raising the black power salute to call attention to racial inequity. And we can pick on other examples of this through time. So in a sense, my first claim to you is what we are seeing with the NFL and these sorts of protests, in a sense, is nothing new, right? It's an opportunity to have a conversation in the present day about police killings and their disproportionate targeting of people of color 
and we can think about the names like Alton Sterling and the list goes on and on. And in fact, I have to stop for a second and think, well, wait a second, I could rattle off names and every time I try to rattle off names, I know I'm leaving off more names and there, you, every month at least, there's a high profile killing of this sort. So the heart of this is using a platform to protest. Now I'm going to stay away from, because I know my colleagues are going to talk about the business issues, the labor law issues, the First Amendment issues around all these sorts of things. My goal, again, is to focus on protesting about racial injustice. I mean, think about it, too. We have a moment where athletes using platforms becomes the space to talk about the pressing issues of the time. And it's, in a sense, part of the civil rights tradition. But what's also part of this tradition is backlash. I've alluded to the president and his tweeting about how wrong it is and how unpatriotic it is. A critical race theorist would look at that and go, well, there is a normalization of a structure of white supremacy being done through this kind of backlash against protest, right? Think of it this way. If the norm is, hey, players ought to go and play, they should not be involved in politics, think about what that evokes, first of all, right? It's sort of a version of do your job. But if you're just seen as a person out doing your job, you are then reduced to that role. And if you think broadly about the NFL or the NBA and race, what are the things that might come to mind? First of all, that the majority of the players in both of these pro leagues are African American, right? And that over time, and there's a rich literature about the commoditization of their efforts and their work. And so if you're treated as just an employee who's, a, who's there to just go make a tackle, then your political speech then becomes implicitly devalued. Now, whether that should be valued or not is a different kind of normative question that I'm going to say for my colleagues. But a critical race theorist would say this is a devaluing along racial lines that makes this complaint about the injustice of black men and women dying invalidated, right? It's a pushback. And so, and think about it this way. I see these economics as most of the players are black, most of the fans are white, and, and you think about the numbers regarding NFL viewership being in flux, you think about the numbers regarding how, you know, I don't even want to do the content analysis on Twitter. I'm just like, well, I don't want to go there. <laughs> you know, I, that's a rabbit hole. But even just a cursory glance and the rhetoric involved evokes images that go all the way back to slavery, right? Play your role, do your job, you're getting paid. And if you dare to protest, there are these images of, well, you're being uppity, you're being contrarian, you need to stay within your lane, to use an athletic metaphor, and go forward where you ought to be. And that sort of keeping your place politics has been evoked time and time again in these moments of moral racial complaint, right? So, this all cuts against one of the things that I often write about in the context of the law of politics, but I think is true here too, is this image of America is post-racial, right? That we are beyond race, that we live in a colorblind society, and that we ought to live up to such norms. I believe in that as an idea, but this is one of those moments where the idea is confronted by the reality. Right, and the voicing of the complaint 
takes, you know, takes the air out of that balloon of we can all live happily ever after in a post-racial world. I think that ultimately this is the challenge, right, that we have as a society a mindset regarding this, and the protest is one of many insistent voices that says the reality that you believe in and the reality that we face are two different things. And it, you can look at political polling data where in a number of contexts, we often see that we as a society live in separate segregated worlds. And that oftentimes our reactions to things like the protests are about the worldview created within that context. Right, so the protest in and of itself is asserting moral claims that are about the illegitimacy of killings by the police, but then the protest in and of itself, and which is why we're here, right, takes on its own life. So in thinking about this in the last minute here, my thoughts gravitate towards this sort of replication of at least the imagery of subservience with and depoliticize subservience at that, which makes one think, well, how do we get past it? A critical race theorist would say, you know, a lot of the options here are ultimately about seeking some form of justice. Now, justice can look like a variety of things, right? Do the players get to protest freely without impunity? Do we want the substantive justice of Kaepernick getting picked up by a team? Or is it a broader question? I put the claim to you here that it's not necessarily about the protest in and of itself, but about the way we know ourselves that might be something that we need to question. Is justice then the, you know, two dozen of us in this room tonight walking away with a different understanding? I mean, these are deep questions. And this is the iceberg in and of itself in broad relief. Now, there are legal details to all these things that I will allow my colleagues to speak to. But remember, the heart of this is the moral claim that black lives are at risk, that protesting about that injustice is necessary, but that at the same time our society in a variety of ways pushes back against that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ellis. Um, so uh, <laughs> next we'll hear from Professor LaFossa. This works. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, um, and um, welcome here. Uh, I'd like to start my talk, which is going to focus primarily on the labor ramifications of Kaepernick's uh, uh, protest, with some thoughts about Dr. Martin Luther King. <clears throat> so, Martin Luther King was born on January 15, 1929, and died 50 years ago today. I'll never forget that because it's actually my brother's birthday. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, it's something I think a lot about and has been important in my life. Now, the day before he, or the, the week, the day before he died, he gave a really, really famous speech. Um, he went to um, Memphis to, to support the Black Sanitation Public Works employees who went on strike for higher wages and better treatment. An example of what was going on were that black workers were sent home early when there wasn't, um, when there was bad weather, but white workers would get paid for the entire day. So it was very obvious discrimination. And Dr. Martin Luther King went over there to support these workers. And he delivers, I've been to the mountaintop address at Mason Temple, the world headquarters of the Church of God in Christ. And he gives this talk. And I'm just going to give you a couple of seconds of it because it's just so famous. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. 
Pentecostals has turned us around, we aren't going to let any injunction turn us. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. We've got some difficult days ahead. I'm going to get into the next. I mean, it's just, I could listen to that speech over and over again. So, so poignant. And of course, it evokes Moses never getting to the promised land. It, pre, it, it actually foreshadows his death the next day. Um, so, it's, it's really just, it gives me goosebumps. And let's just now fast forward to a man that almost 20, almost 20 years after the death of Dr. Martin Luther King, Colin Rand Ka uh, Kaepernick, he is born. Um, he's the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers between 2011 and 2016. And um, let's, again, fast forward to what his controversy is. And this is what Kaepernick says about why he's kneeling during the national anthem. He says, I'm not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. To me, this is bigger than football, and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. There are bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder. I will continue to protest until um, I feel like the American flag represents what it's supposed to represent. Now, some people thought this was really you know, wonderful. Other people thought this was disrespectful to the flag. Um, I don't think it's relevant in that sense what it is. You can have your own opinions as to which this is. I actually don't. It, I have many military people in my family, current, even those currently serving. I do not consider this at all disrespectful to the flag. But you were welcome to disagree with me. What's important for my, my question is, is this concerted activity? And is this, when he's a lone person, all alone doing it, is that different from this when his teammates start to actually um, go with him and join him? Is there a difference? Now, the time, I'm not going to go through the entire timeline, but actually before the really, really famous one when he gains attention on August 26th in the third preseason game, he actually had already done this twice before and gone unnoticed. And he was doing it as his own protest. Um, maybe he wanted to try to get people involved, maybe not, but he wasn't going out of his way to get noticed. He just silently did this. And then he gains attention because Jennifer Lee Chan of the uh, NinersNation.com tweets a picture of the national anthem, but not noticing Kaepernick, and just for some other reason, and it gets picked up that he is not, not standing. And so he tells the media that, look, I sat for these two reasons, the oppression of people of color and ongoing issues with police brutality, as you know, are very important issues of, their day, of our day. And then um, he makes a more comprehensive uh, speech to the uh, statement to the press a couple of days later that I can give you if you're interested. And then a few days later after that, on September 1st, he kneels during the anthem in San Diego, joined by a teammate, Eric Reed. And after the game, he announces that he's going to donate a million dollars to charity. Now, what's important here is that he's now kneeling rather than sitting because after talking to people and thinking about it, he didn't want anyone to feel that he was being disrespectful. So he's actually kneeling before this flag, but he wants to give a symbolic message. And were there state action here, there would, this would be, this should be protected speech. This is something that is symbolic speech. We don't have state action here, so that the constitutional issues are, are non-existent, um, at least in the private sector. Okay? Um, again, on that same day, um, Jeremy Lane of the Seattle Seahawks also sits during the anthem, and he says, I wasn't trying to say anything, I'm just standing behind Kaepernick. Now, that's interesting, 
he's not trying to make a political statement. He's trying to support a worker. Okay, next thing. Megan Rapinoe is a white lesbian, a soccer player, and she decides that she's going to support Kaepernick by sitting during the national or kneeling during the national anthem because she also feels as a minor, a sexual minority that she understands what it's like to have to, to look at the flag and feel maybe it doesn't always represent the liberty that, all, that you think uh, it's supposed to represent for everyone. So she is an ally in this. And then um, you can go on and on. It, it, starts to, it starts to pick up. And even high school kids are kneeling now. Okay, so Garfield High School in Seattle. Okay, then you have in Sacramento. You have the Howard University cheerleaders. And more and more, and it, it culminates on September 22nd when Kaepernick is featured on Time Magazine. Now it's funny, that was, that was when I, I knew that, when I was doing research on this, I knew that, that Trump got involved. And I said, I bet you got involved after that. Because you know, Trump really wants to be the, per he said it, he's been the man who's been on the Time cover, cover of Time Magazine the most of anyone, which is by the way, not true, Nixon has. But he, this is very important to him, so guess what? 9.22, September 22nd, Kaepernick's on the cover. September 22nd at 9.35 p.m., he makes this statement. And this is when he went after, without using his name, Colin Kaepernick. Take a look. Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag to say, get that son of a bitch off the field right now, out, he's fired. Okay. So then it can, uh, oh, I already did this one. Okay, it continues after that and it picks up. So what I wanna ask is at any point was there concerted activity? And you, to determine what is concerted activity, it's protected activity that employers cannot fire you for if you're engaged in that activity. So we have to look at what is the right that's protected. It's protected under 29 USC 157, which we call Section 7. And that protects, in addition to other things, it protects the right to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or mutual aid or protection. Mutual aid or protection. So does that mean it has to be done by two or more people? And the answer is no, it doesn't. And I can give you those, those, I can explain that to you, but you should take labor law and you'll learn all about that. But it absolutely does not have to be done by two or more people. But it does have to be done in a way that is for common cause. If, if he couldn't get people to, to, to deal with him, then, or to, to actually, they, people could have said, no, we don't want to do, we think this is terrible against the flag. It could still be concerted activity. But there still needs to be, potentially a connection to terms and conditions of employment. Now, the case law is unclear where you actually have to have, whether political speech is too far removed from terms and conditions of employment to actually count as concerted activity. All right, but most people would, would right now say it's probably a little too far, which is why I don't want to talk about when he first started, but when his teammates came to his defense, especially after Trump put pressure on the NFL to fire them. And I think it's a no-brainer at that point that he was engaged in concerted activity. There's a case from 1964 that I often quoted in my briefs when I was an attorney, and it's mushroom transportation. It is not questioned that a conversation may constitute a concerted activity, although it involves only a speaker and a listener. But to qualify as such, it must appear at the very least that it was engaging with the object of initiating or inducing or preparing for group action or that it had some relation to group action. So this idea that you are trying to make common cause with your worker, with your co-worker, that's, now that is a long time ago. It's actually gotten more liberal since then. So that's a long time ago, all right? That's before I was born. Not much, but a little bit. Um, and so this is just some other slides that say it doesn't have to be one person. Just the last case I want to talk about is a case called East Tex, where it was found that this was, in, was concerted activity and it was wealthy unionized workers who were circulating a newsletter that, among other things, urged employees to participate in a union political decision of how to vote, okay? 
and the minimum wage bill, which didn't affect it. And the court said even though one was political and one was about a wage, a minimum wage act that didn't affect it, they were making common cause with the working class. And that common cause is, I'm not going to go through all this analysis because I have like 30 seconds left, but I call it the workers of the world unite case. This is a case that says that where you try to make common cause with workers in general and try to help them, then you are engaged in concerted protected activity. And then the employer would have to come back with some sort of justification, okay? Which really segues nicely into whether there are contractual, anything contractual or anything like that. I don't know if that's what my next speaker is going to, our next speaker is going to talk about, but maybe he will. I think they're about out of time, so I'm going to wrap up there and hope that you, this has provoked some questions and just say thank you to everyone here. I really appreciate the opportunity. I didn't know the names of the BALSA students, but would you just stand, Taki? And I don't know your name next to Taki, no, but, no. but thank you so much. To all the other work, the other student leader, oh sorry, to the student leaders that did this, Christian, Jamie, David, I really, really appreciate that. I know we all do here in the panel. Thank you, Professor Alfaso. Um, now, we fall by Professor Frechet. All right. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm going to, um, as I, I often do, um, look at some of these things from a little bit of a different perspective. And so I uh, want to recognize um, this historic day and the loss of Dr. King um, and note that um, while my talk doesn't focus on that, it's not being ignored. It's just not my area of, of focus for today. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was the contractual implications, not just as to the speech implications, but what's going on and what's the business context and for the, the lawyers in the room, um, how this comes about and how it happens. And one of the things, I have a little bit of a unique perspective on how sponsors think. Um, before I was a, a lawyer, before I was a law student, I worked in public relations, worked for video game companies and did a, a, a large number of product launches, primarily for Nintendo. Uh, a couple for, for Midway, um, and did some work with Ken Griffey Jr. Slugfest. You can tell this is a long time ago. Some of you might not even know what an N64 is, which makes me sad. Um, but worked with uh, Kurt Warner's Arena Football. That game did not take off. Uh, I can say now it's probably because it wasn't that much fun. Um, but worked with Kurt Warner to do interviews and, and do product placements. Um, worked with, uh, had restrictions with Kobe Bryant doing the uh, court side too. Um, and these were primarily one-off programs, but had a number of limitations. And what it does do for you as a lawyer, especially looking back on it now, I didn't have the law degree at the time, um, is thinking about what were the sponsors trying to get. And in negotiating with athletes, I did some other product launches with uh, Jake Lloyd, who was the kid in Pod Racer. Um, you know, what is his family looking for? What are they trying to get out of it and going through that negotiation? Actually has a lot of implications in looking at what follows after something um, like th these protests and how they link particularly to sponsorships. So a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about quickly is the, the leagues and the sponsors and athletes. These are kind of the three tiers of what we're looking at when we talk about professional sports in this context. Um, one of the things we have to think about is what's the goal of the contract? Why is the athlete agreeing to do these things? Um, why is um, the sponsor or league uh, interested in this. And some of that's pretty easy. The f thing we'll focus on, because I have uh, 10 to 12 minutes, uh, is the morals clause, which is the one that is, is triggered by these kinds uh, of contracts uh, and, and these kinds of incidents. We'll look at quickly at remedies and the outcomes of what follows from those, and then we'll briefly uh, conclude and try to wrap things up. Um, so um, one of the things to look at is how the different sponsors of the league responded. Right, you have uh, Kaepernick has his protest, other members of the league respond, 
in kind. And you see a, a lot of different sponsors of the league making different statements, right? Remember the league came out and said, we support our players, which got some people upset. Jerry Jones was like, I'm in, I'm out. Um, I'm Jerry Jones. Um, <laughs> And so the sponsors, though, responded in different ways. As a general matter, they were either silent, a number of sponsors didn't issue statements, um, or they had these different views. And so you take a look at Ford. I, gr I grew up a Lions fan, and I'll take your sympathy. Um, this, as a league owner, right, this, this family and company owned the league, they said we respect individuals' rights to express their views, even if they are not ones we share, right? There's a statement there of, of yeah, you can say what you think, but we're, we're not really with you. Uh, Bose says this with a lot more words, but they end again. We respect the freedom. We fly our flags everywhere, they say. We are, every, no matter where we are, there's an American flag. We love it. Uh, and we respect the freedom, whether we agree with those views or not. Right? These are pretty clear statements that we may tolerate it, but we're not cool with it. Um, we have some other companies, Nike, uh, Hyundai, and Under Armour, with much uh, stronger statements, I think, of support. Right. We support athletes and their right to freedom of expression on issues that are of great import importance to our society. That's a different statement than what Ford makes, right? And what this does, and this might not seem like it's about the law, but when you represent clients, this is telling you how they view their role. It tells you how they view their consumers, their customers. Who are they communicating to, right? It tells you that there's a difference, at least in the perception of Ford as to who their customers are and who Nike views their customers. And, and it seems as who uh, Hyundai views there. We stand for inclusion, freedom, and all that represents in these values. Under Armour stands for the flag and by our athletes by, for free speech, expression, and a unified America, linking that probably a little bit softer than the other two, but nonetheless uh, stronger than what we saw from Ford and from Bose. Anheuser-Busch, uh, most of you in the room probably don't re remember or have any connection with uh, Michelob Light, not Michelob Ultra. Before that, there was Michelob Light. They had an ad campaign, uh, yes, you can have it all. And if you Google them on YouTube, they're pretty great ads as long as you put great in quotes. Um, Anheuser-Busch tries to have it all. We're going to cover everything and satisfy everybody. Um, which is reasonably consistent um, with theirs. But they're saying, look, we, we love veterans, we love the flag, we love freedom of express expression, uh, and they try to cover the whole thing. Um, and, and certainly that's fine, but I think that kind of brings together what we're seeing from the other types of sponsors. And part of that might be reflective of a company like Anheuser-Busch, who has a whole lot of brands that is marketing to a whole lot of people. Bud and Bud Light appeal to different people than Michelob Ultra. Right? And they have a whole host of other brands that they're working for. And so their statement is going to reflect differently because they are having different demographics within what they're doing. Right? Um, all right. So what happens to some of the players? Well, after this, uh, Brandon Marshall lost uh, Air Academy Federal Credit Union, came out very strongly against him. Um, CenturyLink, uh, a communications company, uh, dropped him. Um, in turn, he, Russell, uh, Russell Simmons came out uh, with Rush Card and said, I'm picking you up because of your actions, right? And so think about where that plays in. We have things going in both directions here. Uh, Von Miller, Phil, For uh, Phil Long Ford, uh, it was, they came out with a statement, we don't really like what he's doing, we're going to evaluate this. There's a number, if you Google it, a number of places say he lost the deal. That actually didn't come to fruition. He ended up retaining that relationship, not sure, and it raises questions if you represent Von Miller. Do you want to continue with Phil Long Ford? Or is there somebody else does the Hyundai dealership or somebody else who's doing some, some things that is more supportive, maybe that's who you want to work with, right? The athlete can reevaluate this too. We'll talk about how in just a second. Uh, don't want to forget Colin Kaepernick. Now, notice here this does not talk about his job, right, as Professor LaFaso was talking about. This has nothing to do with his job as an athlete. This has to do with his sponsorships, and notice he can have those sponsorships. Uh, he kept uh, his Beats contract, EA Sports, the video game company, kept their relationship with him. Uh, his jersey became the league's bestseller. He was not in the league, and he's still selling more jerseys than anybody else. Sends some messages as well. Um, and then you see other people who have lost sponsorships, Ray Rice, Adrian Peterson, Mike Vick, uh, in other sports, Michael uh, Phelps, Wayne Rooney, the soccer player, uh, Lance Armstrong, Tiger Woods. Now notice the distinction uh, all of the people, not Marshall or Miller or Kaepernick, all of the other people, it's not for concerted effort, it's not for free speech, it's for generally some version of bad behavior. 
right? And notice that brings us, in a lot of ways, to, to foreshadow a little bit, the morals clause that's implicated by this, right? And notice we're lumping that morals clause as being used in both circumstances for really very different kinds of behavior. So when we talk about this uh, as lawyers or as, as people seeking contracts, there's basic things we need to look for. What's the grant of rights? What can the company use? And when I say use, can they use your likeness? Can they use your voice? Can they use pictures, video? What is it that they get to use? What is it that you're granting them as the athlete? Um, what are the duties and obligations? Do you have appearance obligations? Right? Ken Griffey Jr. had to do certain things for Nintendo because of that sponsorship. He had to do certain advertisements. I worked in public relations. He had to do certain work with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, which he actually loved, but he didn't like any of the media, which is a challenge for a media day. Um, thankfully, uh, he really liked the kids, and he was very, very good to them, and the kids liked the media. And so we got what we were looking for because we had very kind children, um, and, and he would do what they wanted. Um, the terms of engagement, how you're going to interact with people, and then finally the morals clause, which is really, I, I think, where we need to look at in the short time I have left. So this is a pretty strict version of a morals clause. If at any time, in the opinion of the company, the athlete becomes the subject of, pu of public disrepute, contempt, or scandal that affects the athlete's image or goodwill, then the company may, upon written notice to the athlete, immediately suspend or terminate this endorsement agreement and athlete services hereunder in addition to any other rights and remedies the company might have. So as we do this, often this is linked with an immediate termination clause. The company can terminate based on an athlete's uh, actions. Player commits any act or becomes involved in a situation that brings athlete into public disrepute, contempt, scandal, or ridicule, or violates public morality or decency, including but not limited to. You might some create a list, lists are dangerous, because sometimes they can limit the scope of what you can use from a sponsor perspective. Thank you, Will. Um, but sometimes we want to have a list. John Daly, the golfer who had an alcohol problem, is famous for the list in his contract. It's very specific about things that will be problematic and can lead to termination. Other times, you don't need the list. You can just use this clause. That's what the first morals clause that I showed you had. Practice note, and applies to those of you who are not lawyers or going to be lawyers. Seek reciprocity. That is, if the player, if the company can terminate, when can I terminate as an athlete? For example, does the company say something negative about the player? I can immediately stop. I might want the check, so maybe I'll stick around, but I have the right to cease this relationship. If the company's insolvent, if I don't think you're going to be able to pay me, I can stop. And finally, a success clause. Right? I negotiated this contract, for example, as a good basketball player or a good football player, but now I'm the league MVP. Think Colin Kaepernick's history right, of how he evolved into uh, a Super Bowl uh, playing quarterback. Maybe if you hit a certain level, if you finish as a tennis player in the top five in the world, I can renegotiate or get out of my contract. So some reciprocity. You want to get out for certain things, I get out for certain things. That can have value to the athlete. The remedies, you can terminate the agreement. We saw that in there. Sometimes it's a, sus a suspension. I'm not going to pay you for a period of time to see if your reputation comes back, which actually happens quite a bit. Uh, a financial penalty, you can write in. If certain things happen, you'll pay us money, uh, or a damages payment uh, from the athlete for a breach. Those are harder to collect. Um, so they can hold compensation that's owed the athlete. We are going to pay you, but we're going to withhold payment. Um, pay you on a pro rata basis. We have a million dollar contract over the course of the year. We're three months in, we're gonna pay you for three months. Uh, you can seek a refund if you've given them a million dollars if there's an advance and say, I'd like the money back. That's not as easy to get. It certainly requires effort. So company wants to pay, or the, the athlete wants the money up front. Company would like to pay over time. You can link those sometimes using a pay or play clause. That is, you don't have to run the ad, but you're gonna pay me anyway, says the athlete. And that works really well on a pro rata basis. So you're paying as you go, but whatever you owe me, you have to pay. So quickly in concluding, because I know I'm out of time, uh, all of this comes to what are the expe expectations and what the athlete is seeking and what the sponsor is seeking. And if you do it right, everybody can get most of what they want. That is, there's a lot to be gained here from the negotiation process. And just remember that the power shifts, right? LeBron James has power that Lonzo Ball does not in negotiating a contract. Um, 
And the last thing I'll say, and don't forget this, you can try to avoid disputes, you cannot eliminate them. You can manage or minimize them, but clients are very gifted in finding ways to screw up even the best clauses that you've created as a lawyer. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Frechet. So um, our last panelist, uh, Professor Bastris, I want to add that um, you might not know this, but Professor Bastris is actually a Hall of Fame college football player. Uh, no, it's not quite accurate. Uh, <laughs> my football team is in my college. Um, I'm not. Um, but your, your team is in your My own. team is in it, and I was on it. And he okay. was on the team. He was on the team. Yeah. Um, well, I think I'm on this panel because uh, I have uh, some working knowledge of the First Amendment. Um, but as uh, Professor LaFasso has already mentioned, um, in these pro-player, pro-athlete protests, there's no state action. And so there's no First Amendment issue to talk about in terms of uh, doctrinal questions. So I've decided to talk instead about um, some historical incidents of athletes and others using sports uh, as a platform to make, to make a statement. Um, and these are going to, I've identified, they're kind of uh, a random in this selection. Uh, my main criterion was that I knew about them. And so that explains their, their randomness. Uh, and I actually remember uh, all but one of them. Um, the first one I don't remember, uh, and that's um, to talk about Paul Robeson. Uh, who was one of the great bass baritone singers of the 20th century. Uh, but he was also a, a great athlete and, and one of the um, most renowned activists of uh, his generation. Uh, he was also the son of a runaway slave. And out of those fairly modest beginnings, uh, he fashioned a, an athletic scholarship uh, to Rutgers, where he enrolled in 1915 as just a third African-American to attend Rutgers, and he was the only one there at the time. Um, he lived up to his part of the bargain on the athletic scholarship. He had earned 15 letters in four different varsity sports in four years' time, uh, and he was a two-year uh, consensus All-American in football. Uh, his status as that All-American uh, gave him the, uh, the ability to attract public attention and controversy during his senior year when he openly criticized the United States government for its, its tolerance of segregation and racial discrimination in the United States while it was simultaneously using young black men uh, in the American Expeditionary Force in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and this was a statement, this was the 1918-1919, an era of extreme nationalism and intolerance, and, and the, the controversy he, he provoked could be um, understandable. Um, he went on, as I said, to, um, well, he became a lawyer, he went to Columbia Law School and graduated there, but he only practiced one year because of the racism he encountered in both his firm and in, in the bar generally. So he pursued an acting and singing career uh, and was uh, really a star, of, literally, of the stage and, and movies and, and concert stage as well and, and uh, recordings. But he was also very much the um, human rights activist. Uh, in the 30s, he uh, worked hard to support the um, evacuation of Jewish ref refugees from, from uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, he helped support the rebels in the Spanish uh, Civil War. Uh, he was a, a lifetime activist in terms of equality for blacks in, in the United States. Um, but he also made a couple trips to the Soviet Union in the 30s, and that drew the attention of the FBI, among others. And Robeson eventually uh, was blacklisted in the 50s. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention, too, he was a very, very bright guy. He, he finished uh, class valedictorian and, valedictorian and Phi Beta Kappa when he was at Rutgers, and obviously attending Columbia Law School is no easy deal. Um, and, I, and I think Robeson is, is the first of the uh, athletes to, to use his um, celebrity to, um, to draw attention to issues that he felt were was important. The second person is one you all know, of course, uh, Jackie Robinson, who merely by stepping on the field on uh, April 15, 1947 and becoming the first African-American major leaguer, uh, he made a major statement. Uh, he didn't have to say anything, just stepping on the field 
was uh, was pretty dramatic, um, and and of course he he encountered uh, an incredible uh, hostility and um, mistreatment uh, from both opposing players and fans as he made his first uh, as he went through his first year, first couple years, um, and he uh, did not re respond uh, uh, because of instructions he had received from Branch Rickey, who said, you know you got to be able to take it. And it was one criterion that Ricky had in, in uh, making him the first African-American major leaguer. Um, he did, however, uh, express his views publicly. Uh, he testified in 1949 before the House Un-American Activities Committee, a rather notorious committee, if you don't know, uh, who was uh, investigating, uh, of all things, Paul Robeson. And, um, who was suspected of being a communist, and some statements Robinson had made about uh, race discrimination, and, and uh, Robinson reluctantly testified, but nevertheless he did elaborate on the racism that he had encountered um, in, in his uh, athletic career. Um, during his last two seasons, he also served as editor of a magazine called Our Sports, and he used that to editorialize against um, uh, uh, racism in sports and race discrimination generally. Uh, he wrote an article which drew a lot of attention uh, criticizing the uh, segregated hotels and restaurants that uh, served the Dodgers and uh, actually convinced many of them to integrate. Uh, after baseball, he came, became very active in the civil rights movement, and he most famously wrote an open letter uh, in his column in the New York Post to um, complained to uh, uh, JFK in very, very uh, emphatic terms about his foot dragging on civil rights. And in stark contrast to our current president, uh, Kennedy's response was to meet with Jackie Robinson, and uh, they, they formed a, at least a, a mutual respectful relationship. And with pressure from Robinson and Martin Luther King and, of course, others, uh, it wasn't too long after that that uh, JFK um, uh, in a speech to the nation, uh, announced his uh, on on civil rights and announced his comprehensive civil rights package, which he sent to Congress uh, at that time. And of course, it passed a year later. Um, my third example is of uh, an athlete uh, who who is not a protester, uh, and but who made a uh, statement of commitment by not playing in a game. Um, it's Sandy Koufax, who was a Hall of Fame pitcher with the Brooklyn Dodgers in the 60s, an incredible pitcher. Uh, and in, in 1965, he had a, a Cy Young year, um, probably one of the best years a pitcher's ever had. And, and of course, he was the manager's pick to start the first game of the World Series. Um, that game, however, fell on Yom Kippur. And, um, and, and Koufax was, was a Jew. And he, he refused to play. He said, I will not play on Yom Kippur. And, and he didn't. And uh, thereby earning the respect of Jews across the country and the ire of Dodger fans uh, wherever they were. Um, and uh, which, which anger only increased when the person named to start in Koufax's place, uh, Don Drysdale, got bombed by the Minnesota Twins that day. And uh, when, when the manager took him out, he, uh, Rysdale said to him, I bet you wish I were Jewish, too. Um, <laughs> uh, Koufax went on to pitch uh, uh, games f two, five, and seven of the series, and he had through shutouts in five and seven and was, I think, the series' most valuable player. Um, my, my next example was only three years later, and it's probably uh, one of the most dramatic moments in Olympics history, when I think uh, Professor Atiba had mentioned uh, John Carlos, that was the, I think you've probably seen this picture of um, two African Americans, Tommy Smith um, and John Carlos, who had that day won gold and bronze medals in the 200 meter race. And at the medal ceremony, uh, they took off their shoes uh, to protest poverty. Uh, they were wearing black socks and black uh, gloves. Uh, and when they received their medals, they stood on the, on the stand and raised their arms with a fist and, and bowed their heads slightly. And they were also wearing a, an Olympic Project uh, Human Rights uh, badge, as was the third person on, on the dais, um, an Australian runner. 
Uh, Tommy Smith, by the way, had set the world record that day for the 200-meter race. Um, this created quite a reaction. Um, the president of the IOC, the International Olympics Committee, uh, was furious and, in fact, took uh, punitive action against the two athletes. And back home, um, they were vilified in many places. Um, of course, the, the salute was um, the classic salute of the Black Panther Party. And uh, although Smith later said in, in his um, memoir that it was actually a human rights salute as opposed to a Black Panther salute, but that's the way it was perceived. And of course, this was 1968, maybe one of the most tumultuous years we've ever had. Uh, you had the key, uh, King assassination, of course, and the riots after that, followed by Bobby Kennedy's assassination, followed by the Democratic Party's uh, convention in Chicago. And, um, and, and so there was a, 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 it was sort of perceived by the whites in particular as an in-your-face gesture desecrating both the national anthem and the, uh, and the flag, um, and, 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 and outright un-American. Um, today, uh, Smith and Carlos uh, are viewed as heroes, and in fact, there's a statute been made of it, a sizable statute exists in, I believe it's in Oakland, of the, uh, of the three uh, athletes on the platform. Of course, the next example um, was somewhat contemporaneous, and that, was, that is uh, Muhammad Ali, and I don't need to go into uh, to explaining what, what his activities were. He, he had all kinds of causes that he espoused. He didn't do it at any particular athletic event, but he certainly used his celebrity status to, to push the envelope on uh, anti-Vietnam War causes, um, civil rights, and, um, and, and many other human rights uh, examples. Um, the next example is not of an athlete protesting, but of the United States president. Uh, on March 21st, 1980, Carter announced that the American, that the United States would boycott the Olympics that year, which were going to be held in Moscow. Uh, this was in response to the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan uh, and their refusal to withdraw uh, meeting to meet uh, Carter's deadline. Um, so uh, Soviet Union invades Afghanistan and Carter punishes the athletes who had spent 15 years preparing to get into the Olympics. There was some degree of irony there. A second irony was that four years later, uh, the Soviet Union uh, boycotted the uh, Olympics, uh, which that year were held in Los Angeles. So uh, uh, Brezhnev got the last word. My last example, uh, I was going to play for you, but... Um, I'm out of time, I think, or just about. Hey, you can go ahead and play. Well, it takes a minute. Is that okay? Sure. I'd have to get it first. I can't get it to work. I'll just, I'll just tell you about this. Uh, the last incident is, is probably the loudest statement in some ways that's ever been made about the national anthem. And it was made by uh, Roseanne Barr, of all people, on uh, July 26, 1990, uh, when the, the San Diego Padres demonstrated incredible poor, incredibly poor judgment by hiring her to sting the Star Spangled Banner before a baseball game. <laughs> and she intentionally butchered it. I mean, she just butchered it. <laughs> and, and the boos started coming and then started coming, and then by the time she was done, they were just rolling down the stands. Uh, how dare you do that to the Star Spangled Banner? And then she finished. Uh, after, after she finished, she emphatically spit on the ground as, as a final insult and, uh, and then went out with her hands in the air doing a jig. Um, the, trouble with, the trouble with that statement was, I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, as far as I could tell, she was just, um, I don't know, trying to be funny, I suppose. 
But uh, now she's a Trumpist reporter, so I guess she has a different view of the Star Spangled Banner. Okay, thank you. So uh, now we're going to do um, the uh, question and answer session. So if you could just, uh, if you have a question, please um, line up behind the microphone there. And before you ask your question, please just introduce yourself as well. I'll ask a question. So I don't know if, yep, it is on. Professor Ellis, I think this would apply to your background the most. I have a good amount of friends in the armed forces. Um, being from where I'm from, most of them are actually minorities of one sort or another. And when it came to the protest, their biggest disagreement was the form of protest. What a lot of them were saying and were saying to me, and I'm, I don't know how security measures really work with the NFL, but what they would have liked to have seen was instead of when they did use police as security, that the players made a stand putting their money where their mouth was, as they would say, to say um, to hire private security and to try and make a show that way. They thought it would be more dramatic. I don't really have an opinion on it, but I would be wondering what you would say as a counter to that or just what your thoughts would be. Wait, uh, just clarify for me a second. Using private security to what end exactly? To Instead of... Instead of using police officers um, from the public for whatever they were doing, say, for security purposes, like with them coming and going to the field for stadium security, stuff like that. Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I want to start from the, from the premise that part of the and I mean, well, let me. Hmm. I could also I say, why not do this. both? But, what? But I mean, David, do you mean because the, it's yeah. it's because they they because they protested, they needed additional security, so they caused the pet taxpayers to be. Paid. No, 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 not that. Their the view one, of it is yeah, that they are not taking significant. Although that was kind of disputed, they're not. A lot of the players who are protesting aren't taking significant financial losses, and they're saying, "Well, put your money where your mouth is." Like take some pain like other people are taking pain. I'm not, I'm not speaking from my own perspective. I'm just saying this is well, my what problem, some of them are going into. All right. As a general matter, I will say that there is an analogy here to the First Amendment in as much as speech is sort of in the, in the voice of the speaker, right? People get to choose however they want to speak. And of course, people can judge that speech for whatever merits or demerits that they see in it, right? And the theory is that the government can't interfere with that conversation, so the technical part of the First Amendment, right, in order to allow that discourse to go back and forth. I, I don't teach First Amendment like Professor Bastris, but I realize that that's sort of the underlying grounds here. I think that that sort of judgment of one ought to invest in some way, shape, or form because you're kind of getting to do this on the corporation's dime. Well, I think that, I mean, my first reaction to that is to say, well, I mean, that might be your point of view about the cost that might be incumbent on making this protest, but I think Professor Fourche's presentation teaches us that there might be a, a lot of cost invisible to the public that these players might be incurring vis-a-vis -vis their sponsors, vis-a-vis -vis their peers, either on their team or as between other teams and the like, right? And so I would tell your friends who are voicing this perspective that they they might partic they might want to pick a particular level that somehow says hey you're you're paying a cost that i can see but you're not necessarily interrogating exactly what the cost of protest actually is and i mean from a 
kind of rhetorical point of view in terms of corporations sending messages to their employees, the fact that Kaepernick and others have been high profile blackballed, so to speak, in terms of their employment, <coughs> or, or I think Jerry Jones being Jerry Jones at one point basically switched from supporting the players to say, if somebody does this again, I'm going to fire them. I mean, there's a lot of cost incumbent to that. And I think that, moreover, that distracts from the ultimate merits or demerits of the message. I think that there, in the history of protest, particularly racialized protest, there's also a history of what is often called kind of respectability politics, right? So when I hear that framed as you're not paying the right sort of cost, there is a judgment being made about, well, what is the right sort of cost and how should you protest? Asking that question in and of itself is making a value judgment. And I would be careful about, if I were talking to them, I would say, are you questioning the time and format and whatever? Or are you trying to undercut the merits of the protest from another way? Right. Sure. So those are my thoughts. OK. Uh, thank you. I mean, if anybody else yeah. wants to weigh any, in. Any other panelists want to weigh in on that question? OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, first, I'd like to thank you guys for being here today. Uh, Calvin Thomas, Atua here at the College of Law. And so my question kind of goes towards uh, Professor LaFalso and the idea of concerted actions. And so given the fact that um, there's ample evidence to show that like there's, there was some concerted action into, into what the protest, I guess of your opinion, like for this, because it seems like it'd be a slow process as things are not coming around and changing. Since players are maybe, maybe afforded these certain protections, then is this more so of a slow process due to statutory interpretation or would you equate it to some of the backlash from the event? And as a second question to um, anyone who may be able to answer it, given that the political climate is still volatile as it is and players are still having their own opinions and having diverse opinions from their, I guess, owners or anyone else, what do you think the future ramifications of such actions as protests going towards in the future, especially since you have these uh, laws in place such as concerted action? Okay, so the first question is, why hasn't anyone brought some sort of action? Is it that they don't understand that, is this a matter of, uh, of, it, of statutory interpretation, and is this sort of my unique interpretation of this, or is, or what's going on here? And I, uh, no, it's not my unique interpretation. This is, these are all Supreme Court cases. This is very standard labor law, and it's, I think that, um, Colin Kaepernick has the hardest job because he started the protest in a way that may not have been concerted. I, that's a different, I didn't talk about that intentionally today. That's a law review article that I'm working on. But, but if, if and, and as far as I know, the other players haven't been, I mean, he, he Colin Kaepernick has not been hired yet, correct? Right. Okay, so he potentially has a claim that if he can prove that these that he wasn't hired because of his concerted activity, and then the employers would have to show, no, it wasn't because of your concerted activity, or it was because of your concerted activity, but we're justified in doing it. So that would be it. Oh. Um, the other, as far as I know, no one else has suffered an adverse employment action. So he may just not have wanted to do that. He may not have thought about that. He may have thought that he had the weakest case because he started off sort of saying that he wasn't making, he was making a political statement and wasn't making a workplace statement. So those are all reasons why I think that happened. I do think, however, that there is a, that we are at a time right now that is unlike I have seen in my lifetime and the closest thing would have been, and I was born in the late, late 1965. So I do sort of have 
a memory of Vietnam and of the little girl that was running and she's naked because she was burned in, with, with the napalm. That's it. I don't really remember much of Vietnam other than that. And so in my lifetime, I think we are coming, it's, things are different now. And you're seeing this with West Virginia, Oklahoma, uh, was it Kentucky and the teachers strike. You were seeing this with, and I told my students the day after the Florida shooting, which my cousin was, had to hide and because she was there that day. She, my cousin's daughter was there. She was, she's a student at that school. So it's affected me personally um, that I said this will be different this time because teenagers can speak and they have nothing to lose. So I think what we're seeing is not your generation, but actually a little younger, my daughter's generation, is going, we're gonna see a lot of protesting and I think concerted activity is on the rise. And as I always tell my labor students, well, you know, this is always a, his, a history, a cycle, and we're, I, get the, I have the dubious distinction of getting to teach labor law when no one cares about it anymore. And maybe finally in the, in the last 15 years of my career that people will start to care about this. So I actually think this is the beginning of something that we are gonna see it. I think part of it started with Black Lives Matter. As probably you know, um, it, it seems like, and I think this is what's so great about the Florida shooting, um, Unfortunately, when black people get killed, the United States people seem not to care. White people get killed, they start to care more. And I think this generation of children actually care if anyone gets killed. They are more colorblind, they are pissed off, and I think that you're gonna see it in the, not just in the political speech, but in this labor speech and other speech, and that's the same thing that happened in the civil rights, and that's why I started my talk today the way I did with Martin Luther King, his political speech, but he was also there for a labor strike. So I think all of this ties together. I, I hope that answers both of your questions. Any, anyone else want to? Um, I'll add a couple quick things. Um, one, I'd say, notice uh, the, the difference between different leagues. Right, so how the NBA responded, how their coaches responded, how the players responded is very, very different than how the NFL responded. Some of that, I think, goes to the demographic, both of the players and who's involved, but I think it, it's deeper than that in terms of maybe the type of sport that it is. Um, the number of players is reduced, so they tend to be, uh, you know, it's less segmented, less reg regimented, and so I think there's things that, that are beyond um, just who, but, but what they do. As, as athletes, teams, and, and coaches, and management. Um, we've seen some other concerted action recently, too. If you look at the women's hockey team, for example, um, sat out uh, in Detroit a couple of years ago and said, you want to have us play in the World Cup, and, or I think it was the World Cup, whatever their equivalent was at that time, and they said, we're not going to go out unless we get paid closer to what the men are getting paid. Um, and they were successful in making that happen, in part because people wanted to watch them. Uh, they, they were leveraging what they were doing, but they did it as a group, and it's why it was effective. And so I think we're seeing a lot of different activity that way. Um, and, and so part of it depends on how the leagues are run and how they interact and, and how the players interact with one another. I think I would add, and I won't necessarily speak to concerted activity per se, um, dare I not speak you know, there I speak outside of my subject matter area. But I think that there is um, a what's different here that also should be mentioned in terms of this being in the era of social media, right? I mean, every, as Professor LaFaso alluded to, you know, everyone from, you know, a preteen with a cell phone to the President of the United States can pick up their phone and sort of contribute to a debate and a dialogue and they can do so based on what they suppose to be true. And I say that very carefully, like what they suppose to be true as to what might actually and objectively be verifiably true. And I think that's a big difference, right? On the one hand, we can push forward and think about progress, right? And, you know, Professor LaFaso mentioned colorblindness and, 
and sort of seeing that as a value in terms of deconstructing these racial barriers, right? But colorblindness can also serve as a value that raises racial barriers, you know? And, and, and think about it in this sense, right? If we assume that there are certain kinds of norms that we all belong together in a society and can function in a particular way, but that n those norms might in some way, shape, or form price people out in a certain way, right? It might be too hard to do a variety of a set of things in society, then those folks who get excluded ultimately then become the underclass, right? I mean, and I'm sort of harping on a pet theory of mine in this sense, but the heart of it is that if we sort of believe in the notion of the continual resolution of, or the trending towards resolving racial equal, inequality issues, then if that becomes our norm, folks who peek through and say, no, we're not fit, we haven't fixed this yet, then become outliers, right? And then a whole dialogue based on the belief, the ideology, of we should normalize, we're post-racial, then excludes those people, and then you've created a whole different racial dynamic. And yet we don't call it racial, and therefore it flies under the radar of either the legal forms that we use to protect against it, or the societal and moral norms, right? Dr. King talking about, you know, his four little children being judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. But if content of the character becomes a proxy for racial division, then you're still playing the same game, but it has a new name, right? And so this borrows from, there's a scholar, uh, Reva Siegel, talks a lot about racial discrimination reinventing itself in each generation. So, with that in mind, what does social media allow us to do? It allows us to construct our own realities and construct conversations and suppose that things are real issues which really aren't, not, aren't, but then they become proxies for the fight that we wanna have. And so the fight continues being fought. So, it's a long-winded way of saying social media is a double, is a mini-edged sword, really, in terms of this, and in and of itself, it won't necessarily make things go away. In fact, in this generation where everybody can tweet whatever, it seems that people, you know, data says that vitriol has become greater, and at the same time, we live in more and more segregated spaces, segregated ideologically, right? Liberals hang out with liberals, conservatives hang out with conservatives and the like. So this is a long way of saying there is hope and there is possibility. And, you know, I believe in that possibility, but that possibility has to begin with grounding our conversations of in the reality of that there is a complaint that has to be answered. I just gave a whole nother speech, and I, but I, as you can tell, I get passionate about this. I'm gonna shut up now. Uh, I'll add a footnote. I, I think Colin uh, Kaepernick's best claim is that he can't get a job because of the concerted activity of the owners, which violates the antitrust laws, which can give him trouble damages, and I don't know why he's not in court. Yeah, I think that's where the premise of my question was coming from, like, since we have these laws, then why isn't there more, I guess, action being taken and stuff? Yeah. Thank you. I, um, I never thought that the First Amendment argument was going to be particularly strong, partly because I had a really good uh, constitutional professor, <laughs> <laughs> Bob Bastris. But I digress. Uh, my question, though, Jim McLaughlin, but. he was he was great. He was hard, <laughs> but he was great. Uh, 
All, and, and the moral clause, the morality clause, I thought, yeah, that's it's such a stretch. I don't know where they got that from. But you did touch on something that I, that I thought that the problem that Colin Kaepernick has is that he, it's a moving target. He can't bring the action against an owner, I think, because I don't know if the public private, the idea that it's my team as a private owner, that you're bringing an action against personally me as a private person. I can, and we've seen, you know, Michael Bennett's been traded. Everyone who protested last year, if you follow it, and I've been following pretty closely, either they're being traded, uh, they, their contracts are not being renewed. There's been a great deal of repercussion. So the target keeps moving. I thought that maybe if Colin Kaepernick could bring it against the league, that, that he might have an opportunity because that's a stable, that's a target that does not move. But when you've been, once you're out the door, as you know, coming back to bring an action against an employer whom you no longer work for uh, creates a whole different dynamic. So uh, my, my question was uh, that, that, as I, that as I see this evolve, I thought our issue was hijacked. I, I thought that Donald Trump is crazy like a fox. I really think he, um, when he took an issue that should have been a free speech issue and made it an American flag issue, uh, I don't know if he did it intentionally, but it was brilliant because it really did dissect the issue in a way where it did become very a, a cultural split because now the, the, the attitudes of each all the parties became different. So I'm wondering still where the remedy is going to, where the remedy is going to come from because I'm looking at labor law and I'm trying to figure out you know how do we fit it into that into that hole, and, and, and I get, Professor Bastrus, that that, uh, that that antitrust action would be one, but no one's ever got that to stick uh, as far as the league is concerned, at least not, not that I've seen. Or, or, or am I, am yeah, I really Kurt Flood did. Uh, in, back in the uh, early 70s <clears throat> when the um, Cardinals traded him to the Phillies, and as happens with most people who get traded to the Phillies, he didn't want to go, right. being a <laughs> Phillies fan. Um, um, but I believe that Kurt Flood, and Kurt Flood uh, challenged the um, Major League Agreement, which restricted the free um, agency of, of players, and I'm pretty sure he challenged, well, that couldn't have been antitrust because the ant baseball's been Excluded well, they from, it with an, they yeah, it with the they have an ex exception to. They passed, uh, they passed legislation. He raised. It was actually a, a it's been protest. A, a protest that that worked to. They they took that employment concerted effort out of the baseball antitrust exemption. Everything else remains. Okay. Um, so but, would that remedy still remain today? Is that what you're saying? It wouldn't remain today because of. Because no. So so Kurt. He, the, the complaint that Kurt Flood has can be remedied at law now through antitrust. Yeah. Okay. It, it, only employment actions, so the, the other other items can't be. Uh, baseball still has the antitrust exemption. The, yeah. the league doesn't, but the I, I think I think Professor Bastris is right that the antitrust claim actually does have some, Do you some think potential it has, it legs. Has merit? Particularly over the last couple of years with American Needle and a few other cases that are starting to say, you know, the, is the league an aggregate or is the league a single entity? And there's been some movement on that. So, I think so again, it has to be the league. It can't be the team. No, I think the teams now working together, it's more likely that you can recognize that the, the league is a single entity right. can't collude with itself. Right. So okay, we have to look at the teams, and I think that's what Professor Bastris was suggesting, is that you'd say the Cowboys are working with the Vikings who are working with the Patriots, et cetera, et cetera, to limit or eliminate the market for this athlete. And the challenge that we've seen, I think, um, is that there's still an argument that this is a talent thing, and that's actually pretty hard. It is. And you saw it with Michael right. Sam, and you see it with some other people. The, the question is, is it really about talent, or is it really about something else? Um, in this case, I think there is a labor law protection that's a better argument than some of the others, but it's still not an easy case, yeah, because not. you still have to, to show that people want them to, to play. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, this goes more, I guess, back to your proxy thing and kind of, where you like David's um, conversation with the guys. Because I want to know, wanted you to expand on it a little bit more. Because I feel like even when you hear questions like that, like why don't you put your money where your mouth is and you and buy extra security, I feel like that almost implies like because I have a problem with like a police force or something or like that's tainted, and I protest that. 
then I can't rely on those people as well. And there's other, like, almost like when you protest something, you cannot use or be part of that. And people try to use that to, That's what it is. like I said, again, taint your whole argument. So like, how do you, how would you approach that? How do you feel about that? Going back to like the proxy hmm. thing. Well, I mean, let's start from the irony, right? Yeah. The, the, the proposition that David's friend put up, and yes, it's not you, it's your friend. And I get that. Um, but yeah, there are people out there who kind of argue that you have to internalize the cost yeah. of, in this context, the racism that you suffer, right? And you should, you know, pay. You know, I have a colleague um, who likes to call this sort of thing, and, and he's far more radical than I am. He calls it like the black tax, right? You have to pay a tax on being black in America in terms of internalizing the cost of the racism that you suffer, right? And, um, and so in that sense, I think the counter to that is in a sense saying, hang on, look at the history, look at the pattern of when that kind of thing has happened. You're asking for Team X to pay for its own security in order to avoid the abuse that they mm. should not have to suffer themselves because they're simply making a claim. And then you can just juxtapose it in different ways, right? I mean, that's been a claim. I mean, look at the list that Professor Bastris offered of people protesting who probably got asked to do similar things, right? And then look at the sort of counter examples, right? Did the Duck Dynasty guy have to pay for extra security, right? Did, um, oh, what's her name, Paula Dean? Is she going to have to pay a surcharge for the butter that she uses to cook while she's holding a, you know, a ceremony where she's trying to romanticize the slavery era, right? Or, you know, it. it to me, the fact that it's sort of unidirectional yeah. in this sense, in and of itself kind of says that this is a proxy for some other disagreement with the substance of the claim. And I think that, and you know, I was having a conversation with a friend the other day who was kind of wondering about this exact thing. And it was a different context and I don't want to tell my friend's story because it's his but not mine, but he tells me this story which raises these same sorts of issues and I respond with them, my response to him was basically, well tell me why that's true when the opposite won't work, right? Explain to me, you, you know, and framing it as this is a contradiction, this is sort of a paradox because you do want it in this context but not in this other context, why are those two squareable in your mind? Because at the end of the day, you know, at least my approach to this is that they're not. And so it have to be a really good explanation. Yeah, because I feel like those, it's almost like if I, okay, if I did pay for the extra security, like you said, how does that help me when it comes to police brutality? Or does that just do something in your mind for making my argument valid now? but doesn't really change my position mm. on anything. But yeah. Yeah. Is there anything anybody else want to? I have nothing there. No, but now I understand, I understand where they were coming from. And I just, I think what for me, what reminded me of was, um, it would be like, if we were to tell women that they should all, you, we all just need to have bodyguards and then we wouldn't be raped. Yeah. So it's also putting the bad behavior that, well, you know, People can engage in bad behavior. You just have to protect yourself. And so I think it really does flip it. And that's something I would say, David, to say to your friend. Like, or you have to think about, I mean, you have to find something. This is the problem with privilege. And I always tell my students, you know, that because I think a lot of like white males here in West Virginia are not privileged, but they have whiteness as a privilege, and they have, they have um, maleness as a privilege. So they don't understand, well, I'm not privilege, look at me, if I went to New York, I can't get a job there because I'm discriminated because of my accent. And so it's hard sometimes for people to see this. So I always try to find an example of something that would really hurt them. 
and then they see it. So I think every woman in this room when I said that was like horrified and it really brings out that what was going on there. So thank you for clarifying that. No problem. So we have just like a couple, two minutes remaining. Anyone, uh, we have time for maybe one more quick question. Oh, okay, well, um, thank you all very much. It's been a very illuminating panel. Thank you, that was great. I learned a lot. <laughs> Yeah, good seeing you. I think I had lunch with you like a few days ago. Your wife also? That's right. That's right. Is she also in the college? I remember.